Hello and welcome to this podcast on cell signaling part 2. In part 1, if you remember, we talked about the five major steps of cell signaling. We said the first one is the production and release of a chemical signal, which upon its release is going to bind to a receptor protein. That's the reception part of cell signaling. That receptor protein, we said, could be on uh, the cell surface, so uh, as a cytoplasmic, uh, sorry, as a membrane receptor, or it could be inside the cell as a cytoplasmic receptor. Binding of the, recept the, the signal to the receptor would trigger changes inside the cell, and in the case of membrane receptors, would result in a signal transduction pathway that would result in the formation of several relay molecules leading to a cellular response. Now, the activation of this signal cannot go on forever. It has to be deactivated. And the deactivation process is as important as the activation process itself. And the deactivation is a way to regulate the uh, chemical signaling and as a way to deactivate it and terminate it. In the first part, we talked about the type of chemical molecules that we have. If you remember, we talked about three types, autocrine, paracrine, and uh, endocrine. And then we talked about receptors and their classification, and we classified them as under two categories, cytoplasmic and membrane receptors. In part two, we will uh, talk about signal transduction and what it means and how it can lead to a cellular response, the effect, the final effect on the cell as a second topic. The third topic, we will talk about the different ways by which a chemical signaling system can be deactivated and regulated. And the last topic in this podcast is about a type of communication that does not involve any signal transduction or any receptors. So let's start with signal transduction. So we'll start with the definition of signal transduction. And as I mentioned again in the first part, Signal transduction involves a, it involves a process by which an external signal is converted to a different type of signal inside the cell that is amplified thousands and thousands of times. So if we take the example here of epinephrine as the signal, which acts on an adrenergic receptor or epinephrine receptor on the membrane, which is a G-protein coupled receptor resulting in the formation of this second messenger here, cyclic AMP. That cyclic AMP, when it's produced, it activates protein kinase A, which in turn is going to activate a phosphorylase kinase enzyme, which in turn will activate a glycogen phosphorylase enzyme. That enzyme would act on glycogen, which is the storage form of glucose and hydrolyze it into glucose 1-phosphate, which is then dephosphorylated to produce glucose, which will diffuse out of the cell and flood the blood with glucose. This is, this is what we see here happening from the production of cyclic AMP all the way to the activation of the enzyme, the last enzyme here, is the signal transduction pathway. And, as we, and, and we can see here the actual amplification. From one molecule of epinephrine, we produce 20 molecules of cyclic AMP, leading to the production of 10,000 molecules of glucose. That's the amplification process. So the signal transduction, it happens inside the cell, and it involves membrane receptors. The two types of membrane receptors that are involved or that work through signal transduction pathways are G-protein coupled receptors, like in that case here, epinephrine, as well as uh, protein kinase receptors that act through a cascade of phosphorylation. So in, in that uh, protein kinase receptor, the signal transduction pathway involves the autophosphorylation of the receptor itself, which leads to the phosphorylation of different kinds of protein. In that case here, the first one is RAS. RAS, by the way, is uh, a protein that is involved in um, a type of cancer known as sarcoma. And uh, RAS comes from, the RA comes from rat and the S, sarcoma. So rat sarcoma, that's when it was first discovered. Any mutation 
uh, in this system might lead to the uh, um, activation of RAS without the activation of the receptor. So in a normal signal transduction pathway of that kind, the activation of RAS would lead to the activation of another enzyme, uh, in that case here, uh, a RAF, and then RAF will activate MEC, and then MEC will activate MAPK, and then MAPK can go into the, into the nucleus and uh, activate transcription. So this is another example of signal transduction pathway, and in that case here uh, is that of a growth factor that would result in the formation of certain proteins through trans activation of transcription. Let's look now at the, uh, the cellular response due to cell signaling, activation of cell signaling systems. Now, uh, the cellular response could be of different types, but we can categorize them under three primary forms. The first one is opening of ion channels. And we are going to give the example here of ion channels found on nerve cells. And the example here is that of nerve cells found in the nasal cavity, in the roof of the nasal cavity, and uh, how they respond to odorant molecules. So molecules actually signals coming from the outside in that case here. Those molecules, they bind to receptors. In that case, here it's a G-protein coupled receptor, resulting in the formation of a chemical signal cyclic AMP, which acts on ion channels, causing them to change conformation, to open, and when they open, they allow ions, in that case here, sodium and calcium, to diffuse along their concentration, the gradient, resulting in the formation of a signal. In that case here, the signal is electric. It's an electrical signal that will travel from this neuron in uh, the roof of the nasal cavity to the part of the brain that is involved in interpreting uh, olfactory signals. The other type of uh, cellular response involves changes in the activities of enzymes. And uh, we gave the example previously on um, the uh, activation of glycogen phosphorylase uh, under the effect of the activation of the adrenergic uh, uh, receptors. Uh, so in that case, it's actually a series of enzymes have been activated, uh, resulting in, in that case here, a cell response, which is the uh, release of glucose into the bloodstream. So that's that's the second type of uh, cell response. The third type of cell response involves uh, changes in the level of gene expression. And the example here is that of uh, the lo uh, lipid soluble uh, uh, signals that diffuse into the cytoplasm, bind to their cytoplasmic receptor, and form a complex that would uh, diffuse or would uh, be uh, transferred to the nucleus to act as a transcription factor resulting in the formation of specific proteins. That's what we mean by um, gene expression. Now, the activation of chemical signaling systems has to be regulated and it cannot uh, go on indefinitely. And this is important for receptors to uh, free themselves of the chemical signals so that uh, they can remain sensitive to future signals. And this is what we, what we call uh, signal deactivation. And there are different ways by which signaling systems can uh, deactivate the signal. And we are going to give a few examples, starting with phosphatases, protein phosphatases. Uh, if you recall from the, uh, uh, the G protein linked receptors, uh, the second messenger cyclic AMP, activates protein kinase as, as its first target. And that protein kinase, like all kinases, what they do is they transfer a phosphate from ATP by hydrolyzing it to a protein. And then when they do that, they raise the potential energy of uh, that protein. In that case, it's an enzyme and causing it to become active. So that's, that's how the signal transduction pathway starts. This pathway can be deactivated by the activity of phosphatases, and by definition, a phosphatase, it removes a phosphate from a protein or from a substrate and releasing, release it as an inorganic phosphate. And by doing so, 
it's going to deactivate in that case here the enzyme so this is one way another way is by the use of GTPases cells produce G GTPases and those they break down or they hydrolyze GTP into GDP and in that case here they specifically hydrolyze GTP bound to G active G protein and then by doing so they render it inactive so that's the second way third way is by the use of a third type of enzymes phosphodiesterases we'll give the example of cyclic AMP here cyclic AMP the second messenger is produced from ATP when the effector enzyme and in that case here is known as adenylyl cyclase or adenylate cyclase that produces cyclic AMP from ATP cyclic AMP is usually deactivated and it's the reaction is very fast it is deactivated by phosphodiesterase which converts cyclic AMP into AMP the inactive form so these are three ways there are other ways by which uh, cells can deactivate signaling systems one of the second messengers that is produced is nitric oxide known as no nitric oxide is as you know is a gas and it diffus diffuses very fast and by the mere fact that it diffuses, it becomes inactive if it moves away from its uh, uh, target, target molecules to which it's going to react. So the, uh, in that case here, its concentration is, is, is crucial. And uh, when it's released in smaller amounts and it starts diff or it starts diffusing, it's going to become inactive. Another example is that of calcium. Calcium when it's released under the effect of second messengers, it can by itself act as a second messenger. And then one, one way of deactivating calcium is by pumping it back into its storage organelle, and which is usually the endoplasmic reticulum. So we decrease the concentration, therefore we decrease the effect, and that's how we deactivate the signals. The last topic of this podcast, as I mentioned, is the intercellular communication direct communication between cells without involving uh, receptors without reception without cell signaling or cell um, or, or signal tra uh, transduction pathways and we are going to give the uh, two examples one in animal cells and one in plant cells in the animal cells the example is that of gap junctions as you remember gap junctions they link the two cells through their membranes by special proteins that form like tunnels or channels the connexon proteins and uh, through those proteins uh, molecules or charged particles can diffuse charged particles can diffuse from one cytoplasm directly into another through those gap junction proteins uh, the best example here uh, that I can give if, uh, is that of gap junctions found uh, between uh, cells of uh, the heart cardiac muscle cells communicate that way and they use the uh, gap junctions to uh, quickly uh, spread the signal from one cell to the other like the activation of one cardiac muscle cell can lead to the spread of a signal which usually here is ions from one cell to another throughout the cardiac muscle tissue and this is important and crucial to allow for example the uh, the ventricles of the heart to contract as one unit the other example is that of uh, uh, plasma desmata in plant cells as you remember plasma desmata those are again uh, channels or direct links uh, between plant cells and they involve usually tubes or tubules that link the site of uh, the endoplasmic reticulum of one cell to that of another cell those tubes are known as desmotubules and in those desmotubules molecules that are found in one cytoplasm can actually quickly diffuse and transfer it to the cytoplasm of another cell the best example that I could give here is that of C4 plants C4 plants uh, like in the mesophyll cells they produce C4 they produce malate under the effect of peptidoxylase and then malate can diffuse in here and then be converted to CO2 and pyruvate in that process. So this is one of the uh, ways, quick ways to uh, transfer molecules or signals from one 
cell, one cell to another in uh, plant cells. And that concludes our podcast.